Churches of Christ present Speaking the Truth in Love, a program bringing you life's answers from the Word of God. Hello, my name is James Malone and I'm the preacher at the Washington Avenue Church of Christ in Jonesboro, Arkansas. I hope that you'll take your Bible today and open with me to Exodus chapter 17 as we study together from the Word of God. You might also want to grab a pen and a piece of paper so you can take a few notes as we go through our study together today. Before we get into the lesson, I want to take a moment and let you know that the program today is being brought to you by the area churches of Christ who are listed at the end of the program. If you have any Bible questions, if you would, stay tuned to the end of the program and you can contact any of those congregations listed that you will see there. I also want to thank you for taking the time to tune in to the program today. I want us to study today a passage from the Old Testament that contains a, a good number of firsts. It's a dramatic passage as it includes there the very first battle that was ever fought by the nation of Israel. It also contains the first reference to a young man by the name of Joshua. It describes the, the first real organized conflict with the people known as the Amalekites, an enemy of God's people for many, many years. And in a rather interesting little piece of bonus information, the passage that we're going to be looking at today also contains the very first reference to writing, as Moses is commanded to write down what happens on this occasion. And so it's the first reference to the writing of Scripture, and we find it in Scripture. The passage is found in Exodus chapter 17, verses 8 through 16. By way of background, we should try to remember that the Israelites had been freed from more than 400 years of slavery 
in Egypt. They'd crossed over the Red Sea on dry ground. They had seen the bodies of the Egyptian soldiers wash up on the seashore. They had been fed with manna from heaven. In the first part of Exodus chapter 17, they had been given water from a rock. And so today as we look together at what was written by Moses in the second half of Exodus chapter 17, I want us to consider together several ideas that will hopefully be able to help us change the way that we think, even change the way that we live if need be, even today. So let's look together at our text, Exodus 17, beginning in verse 8. Now Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, Choose us some men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses... Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And so it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands became heavy. So they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands one on one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this for a memorial, and recount it in the hearing of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called its name, The Lord is my banner. For he said, Because the Lord has sworn, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. As we look back over this paragraph of Scripture today, I want us to answer the, the so what question. Or in other words, why did God tell Moses to write this down for our benefit nearly 3,500 years later? And one of the first things that we notice in this text is that Israel was facing a, a very pressing concern. Israel was facing a very real enemy. And again, as we look back over the first half of this chapter, we find that God had just provided these people water from a rock. They were out there in the wilderness, somewhere between two and three million people. They were thirsty. And God provided them water from the rock. And so they were incredibly blessed. Things were going well for these people, but right after this incredible blessing, we find that they were challenged by the Amalekites. Now from looking at the scriptures, we find that God's people had a long history with the Amalekites. We're not told everything here in this particular passage, but Moses, as he's getting ready to die some years later, he looks back on his life. And he gives us a few more details about what happened with the Amalekites that led up to the battle that we've read about today. I want us to, to turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 25. Deuteronomy chapter 25 in verses 17 through 19. There Moses is looking back on his life. And there he says this, Remember what Amalek did to you on, on the way as you were coming out of Egypt, how he met you on the way and attacked your rear ranks, all the stragglers at your rear, when you were tired and weary, and he did not fear God. Therefore it shall be when the Lord your God has given you rest from your enemies all around in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess as an inheritance, that you will blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven, you shall not forget. And so we find that the Amalekites would sneak up behind God's people. They would pick off those who were old, those who, who were tired. They wouldn't attack from the front, but instead they would attack from the rear. They would sneak up behind God's people. And the key we find in verse 18 of Deuteronomy 25 is where we find that the Amalekites did not fear God. 
They had no respect for God, and so they didn't care about God's people. They were brutal. They didn't fight fair. And we know from the scriptures that the Amalekites were the descendants of Esau. And it seems that Jacob and Esau, they were always fighting. And apparently that rivalry continued through the generations. The Amalekites were some very serious enemies to God's people. And so now we come back to that so what question. What do we learn from this? Well, we learn that God's people had enemies. We also learn and we understand that God's people continue to have enemies today. God's people will always, always have enemies. We live in a world where our faith is under attack. The weak and the stragglers are picked off from behind, even today. All of us as Christians, as God's people, we have a common enemy. We're in a, a common struggle. Paul summarizes this ongoing battle for us in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12 where he says, For we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. You know, sometimes Satan will attack us head on. But more often, he comes in from behind. He sneaks up on us. He picks us off from the rear. He goes after those who are struggling in their faith. He gets us in a, in a moment of weakness. He comes at us when we're tired or when we're stressed out. He gets us when we're overwhelmed, perhaps with our finances. He gets us when we're lonely. He works on us just a little bit at a time. Maybe we slack off in our daily study of God's Word. Maybe we don't pray as often as we used to. Maybe we start missing assembling together with God's people. And before you know it, we've fallen. We've been picked off from behind. And so first of all, we learn from Exodus chapter 17 that just like God's people from all those years ago, we face an enemy. And we need to be aware that the threat is very real. We need to be ready for it. As we look back again at what happened with the Amalekites, we also notice something that's very encouraging. We notice that we don't fight alone. In verse 9, we find the first reference to Joshua in the entire Bible. Moses picks Joshua, and he sends him to go round up some men to fight the Amalekites. But we notice, too, that Moses doesn't just delegate this task. He doesn't just delegate this responsibility, but he heads up to the place where he can watch the battle. He goes up with Aaron and with her, and as they're up there, they find that when Moses lifts up his hands, and he's holding the staff of God, the Israelites win. But when he lowers his hands, the Amalekites begin to win. And when it finally clicks in their head, Aaron and her get Moses set up on a rock and they support his hands. And so just as Joshua didn't fight alone, he had those men that he had gathered together, Moses didn't hold up his hands on his own. His arms got tired. And so Aaron and her were able to help him do what needed to be done. As Christians, I think most of us can understand what's going on here. Satan attacks us every day. Sometimes the, the stress of living is almost unbearable. The temptations keep coming. And to make it through the day, we need the support and we need the encouragement of our Christian friends. We need someone to bring in a rock for us to sit on. We need someone to hold up our arms when we're too tired to keep going on. And when that support is offered, when our Christian friends come in and they offer support to us, let's accept that support. When the load's too heavy for us to bear on our own, we should allow others to step in and to help us out. 
Now today the temptation might be to think, well, my problem's too private. This is something that I can handle on my own. I don't want anyone else to know about it. Or maybe we think to ourselves, sure, we can let someone help us with this situation, but it would take more time for us to teach them. Take more time for us to teach them what needs to be done than if we just did it ourselves. Or maybe we're tempted to think that by allowing someone to help us on some sort of special project, we're giving up some sort of turf. We're giving up some kind of control that we, we've established in our own minds. But we need to notice that in our text for today, we don't see any competition there. There's no rivalry between Moses and Aaron and her up on the mountain. There's no rivalry with Joshua down there on the battlefield. No one's power is threatened. But these men are working together against a common enemy. And the same is true today. We don't fight alone, but we share the load. Now, that's the purpose of the Lord's church. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, <clears throat> as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as you see the day approaching. Our major purpose in coming together on, on the first day of the week, one of our major purposes in coming together, assembling together as the church, is to encourage one another to keep on keeping on. Certainly we were reminded of that responsibility a little bit later in the book of Hebrews. As the author says in Hebrews 12, verses 12 and 13, Therefore strengthen the hands which hang down, and the feeble knees, and make straight the paths for your feet, so that, when, so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather healed. As Christians, we're to lift up one another. We're to strengthen the hands that are weak. We're to strengthen the knees that are feeble. We could also consider what Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2 where he said, bear one, another, bear one another's burdens. And what? And so fulfill the law of Christ. Over and over again. The Bible tells us that we're to encourage one another. We're facing a, a pressing concern. We're facing a real enemy like the Amalekites. Satan is a real enemy. But we learn from Exodus chapter 17 that we don't fight alone. We are in this fight together. One more very important idea that I want us to consider from our text today is that as we face these issues together, God is our banner. God is our sponsor. We look at this paragraph of Scripture, and we have to ask ourselves the question, what is Moses doing? What does Moses think that he's doing? As I started looking into this text, as I started researching this lesson, I kept finding sermons about the importance of prayer. But when I compared what, what people were saying to what we actually find here in the Scriptures, I couldn't find a single reference to prayer anywhere in this passage. But when we look at verse 9, we start to understand what's really going on here. In verse 9, we find that Moses went up onto the mountain for the purpose of holding the staff of God in his hand. Now, what's the big deal about the staff of God, the rod of God. Well, this rod was basically just a big stick that Moses used during his time as a shepherd. But you might remember that when God called Moses out of Midian to go to Pharaoh, God allowed Moses to do some amazing things with that stick. You might remember that he turned that staff into a snake, and then it turned back into a staff. Several chapters later, we come to Exodus chapter 9, verses 22 and 23. The Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward heaven, 
that there may be hail in all the land of Egypt, on man, on beast, and on every herb of the field throughout the land of Egypt. And Moses stretched out his rod toward heaven. And the Lord sent thunder and hail and fire darted to the ground. And the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt. Well, we see something similar with a number of the other plagues that God sent to Egypt. Moses stretched out his hands toward heaven and something bad happened to the enemies of God's people. Shortly after that, Moses would lift his staff and the people would cross the Red Sea on dry land. And even just a few verses earlier in chapter 17 of Exodus, Moses was told to take his rod and strike the rock. And when he did, that water flowed out of that rock. Moses did something when that, with that stick. And when he did, something amazing always happened. And so this staff came to be a symbol of God's power. When we come to verse 15 of Exodus 17, we make an interesting connection. Moses built an altar to commemorate this great victory. He named it Jehovah Nisi in the King James Version. And that Jehovah Nisi, it literally means the Lord is my banner. The word banner refers to a standard. Basically, a flagpole that would be carried into battle. From what I've read, ancient armies before the days of radios, before the days of GPS units, they would rally around a tall pole. And the standard bearer would then lead the army into battle. Apparently the, the standard bearer wasn't armed. And if he were to be injured, if he were to be killed, then someone else would drop their own weapon. And they would take up the banner. The banner was almost like an advertisement. This is who we are. This is who we're fighting for. Moses was going up on top of that hill as a way of saying, God is our sponsor. This is who we are. We are God's people. And those of you who have been picking us off from behind, we want you to know exactly who it is who's about to defeat you. It's almost as if Moses was saying, we're going to beat you with this stick. This is the staff of God in my own mind. I picture the raising of the flag over Iwo Jima. That standard continues to be important even now. It's significant. It's a, a significant thing to raise a flag. The banner indicates ownership. It indicates a relationship. And so as we face our problems, as we face our situations and our concerns today, Maybe we can remember that God continues to be our sponsor. God is our banner. God is our owner. And God has promised to always be with us. I hope that our study today has, has been some kind of encouragement to all of us. We've learned that just like the ancient Israelites, we're also facing a very pressing concern. Almost on a daily basis, we're challenged with temptation. We're challenged with sin. We're challenged with discouragement. Satan is a real enemy. And Satan wants nothing more than for us to fail. But secondly, we also learn that, that we don't fight alone. And just as Aaron and her held up Moses' hands... We have the ability to encourage one another in the church. We fight together. We face our challenges together. We encourage one another to keep on going. And then finally, through it all, we're able to say that God is our sponsor. God is our banner. That's what Moses said. The Lord is our banner. We represent the Lord. And the Lord will ultimately be responsible for our victory. As we close today, 
I want to explain that God made victory over sin possible. And He made that victory over sin possible by sending His only Son as the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Jesus died. Jesus was buried. And Jesus was raised up on the third day. In the same way, we are called by God to die ourselves. That is, we turn away from all forms of sin. We're to be buried in water for the forgiveness of our sins. And at that point, we're raised up to live a brand new life. If you're curious, if you want to study more, we'd love nothing more than to sit down with you and study together with you from the Word of God. But if you already know what you need to do, if you believe, if you're willing to repent, if you're willing to confess your faith in Christ, if you're willing to submit your will to Him in baptism for the remission of your sins, We'd encourage you to seek out a congregation of the Lord's church in your area. Let them know about your desire to obey the gospel, your desire to become a Christian. I appreciate you tuning in today, and I look forward to the next time that we can study our Bibles together. If you have a Bible question, would like to receive a free Bible correspondence course, would like a copy of two free books, Why I'm a Member of the Church of Christ, and Basic Bible Lessons, please contact the Nettleton Church of Christ. Speaking the Truth in Love can be viewed online. Speaking the Truth in Love is brought to you by these area churches of Christ. Jesus saves, Jesus saves.